Hi, you are in the ladies' room with Dr. Danica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Danica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Danica. Today, we're talking with Dr. Dara Cass, who's an assistant clinical professor at Columbia University School of Medicine. She's the director of equity and inclusion of Columbia's emergency department and the founder of Feminem, an advocacy and resource site for women in, in emergency medicine. Previously, she was the Director of Undergraduate Medical Education at NYU and an Assistant Program Director at Staten Island University Hospital. She is very active both in the Academy of Women in Academic Emergency Medicine and the American Association of Emergency Physicians. Now, alongside the growth of Feminem, she's developed a niche in advancement of women in emergency medicine. She's invited regularly to speak on topics such as professional development of women, unconscious bias, and achieving gender equity in emergency medicine. And of course, we want to speak with her about all of that. But since this is the ladies' room, we also want to get very personal. Now, most mothers say that we love our kids so much that if they needed an organ donation, we would sign up to be the donor. She actually did. Welcome, Dr. Cass. You're in the ladies' room. I'm very excited to be here. It is my pleasure. So tell us all about uh, Sammy and how this living donor situation came about. Oh, all about Sammy is a long conversation. The donation <laughs> is a much simpler conversation. So uh, Sammy Cass is our third kid. Mm -hmm. uh, we had had two kids, normal, like non-exciting life. You know, everything was fine. Decided to get pregnant again. Everything is fine. He comes out a little small, like smaller than my other kids. We get to find out after a couple of months that he has an inherited condition called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which uh, if anyone that's listening is a doctor or knows anything about inherited conditions, he had received a gene from my husband and from myself. But you didn't know that this was in your family prior to this? No. And he, uh, so it was kind of a very interesting moment because the doctor we had, who was another woman physician and a mom was basically like, don't worry, this is totally fine. It's going to be, he's, he's going to grow out of the liver problem, which is what he was having at the time. And you know, the science is good and basically put it as we're going to watch and see for a few years until he's like 30 or 40. And then we'll deal with the consequences of this disease. Because there are many people who have this who aren't even diagnosed till they're well into adulthood and have developed other complications like emphysema, correct? Right. The majority of patients don't know until they're at least 40 years old. And so a 10% find out when they're babies. And of those, a fraction of those go into needing a liver transplant. So the numbers were in our favor to have to do nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we said, okay, we'll do nothing. We'll watch and wait and see what happens. And as luck would have it, I... Uh, it, in the process, just, you know, of deciding, of understanding the disease, my husband, who's not a doctor, mm -hmm. asked how we could cure him of the disease. And the disease itself is about a protein that's folded poorly, and it's made majority in the liver. And that's actually why, part of the reason why you have liver failure. If you can't get it out of the liver, it clogs it up like a sponge that becomes really, really hard. Right. And it so creates I said some, heart tissue in the liver, which is basically cirrhosis. It's exactly what it is. And so that, that scarring and inflammation causes a, 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 a constellation of effects that causes the person to need a new liver. So I said to my husband, well, you know, we could just replace his liver and then he wouldn't have the problem. My husband, who is in finance and solves problems for a living, you know, said, let's just do that. And I was like, you don't just do that unless you have to. <laughs> well, fast forward to about a, a year later, uh, I was in the ER with him for a very minor kind of in infection, like was flu season. And they said to me that his liver was failing and that what I consider being a living donor. And What's amazing to me and something I don't talk about that much is in that moment, I said yes immediately. And that goes back to the idea of the manufacturer's guarantee, which is what you were talking about, right? The idea that we had made him with faulty parts. And so if he needed new parts, they were going to come from us. Um, the only other person I feel that way about is Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which if she's- And I'm on that line too. Delivered donation, I'm on it. <laughs> she can have my heart. I mean, honestly, I only got one of them. She can have it. So well, I'm reserving I, my heart in case my kids need a, a donor. But 
<laughs> right. Well, yeah. So my point is, so I, I immediately said yes. And one of the things that I think is really important, and we can talk about this a little bit later, is part of the reason I had CS so quickly was not just because I knew that I was going to do it, like as a mother, but there was no option. But it was also because I lived in the system for so long around organ donation, and I had seen so many people wait for so long at real, um, you know, get sicker and sicker and eventually even get too sick, too sick for transplant if they didn't get the organ fast enough. And the numbers that we have in New York are so bad for donation and for recovery. And the system is so broken that I knew that we could bypass the entire broken procurement system and the entire broken donation system just by solving it in our own family. And in all the privileges of the world that I processed in that moment, in the ER while my son was being evaluated and his doctor was asking me to lay on a table and become a patient, immediately those things all go in and I have this movie that goes on of my kid getting sicker and sicker and waiting for a system that's broken to work, find an organ, get it to him in the middle of the night, rush in and all those things didn't have to happen because I was fortunate enough to be able to be worked up as a living donor. And all these thoughts went through your hat, uh, through your head before you knew you were a match or you just assumed you were a match? So I knew that I was going to try to be a match, right? So at the end of the day, like, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to be told you can't do it. Uh, you start getting worked up. And the first question they ask you is, is this really coming from a good place? Do you really want to, like, you know? <laughs> As if. <laughs> like, the question they always ask you is like, so what are you expecting in return? And they do it because it's like, you know, you want to make sure that the donation is coming from an altruistic place and that you're not going to resent the patient if it goes bad, Right. <laughs> So not every donation yeah, it takes. We, we do say as mothers, we are all in. But of right. course, there is a failure rate, even for the donors. There's certainly a failure rate for the uh, recipient. uh, recipients. Uh, for the donors, I think the failure rate is about 0.01%. And now with the way that the advancements in technology and science, everything has gotten, I mean, now it's, 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 it's the risk is real, but not, not, not zero, right? right? But you know, again, against the as as a mother and as a doctor, thinking about the systemic risks to our family, kind of writ large, which were included me becoming a patient and a donor, but also what would happen to another member of our family if he didn't get the organ. I felt like we were in a risk benefit ratio in favor of transplant. Um, the benefit ratio for you as the donor was far greater uh, and far better than the risk of crossing the street. So let's yeah, and and that. and and that's exactly right, right. So so we take risks every day, and I say this a lot in the ER and all the things that people want to minimize their risks in life. And so I knew I was in a, I had a great you know institution, and I trusted them immensely. And you know, so I wasn't I wasn't really worried about myself, and I mean that not in the kind of oh I'm such a great mom that I wasn't worried. I really wasn't worried about myself. I knew that I trusted the system I was in enough. And I, I do need to, to make a point me. also that your risks to your own health as the donor were far less than your risks as the mother giving birth when you gave birth to him. So the yeah. risk of childbirth is actually, the risk to your health as a mother are far greater than- For pregnancy. Yeah. Pregnancy uh, is a disease process, man, let me tell you. It does all kinds of things to your body. <laughs> Some of, of which course, you never get back. 25 to 30% of women are having C-sections and C-section is also right. major surgery. So, you know, there are all these things that we take risks of. But a lot of people don't know anything, including a lot of physicians, don't really know that much about what it means to be a living donor or even that that was a possibility. Of course, when we talk about living donors, the main organs we're talking about are kidneys. So that's the most common living donor procedure. But living donor for portion of your liver is increasingly common. So explain how much of your liver did they take um, for his surgery? So they, so the, the, the size of the liver that they take is proportional to the patient receiving it. Mm -hmm. So they do a calculation on the size of the person that is getting it. And so the smaller the person, the less they have to take. Uh, and it's actually a gram ratio to the size of the person's body. And the amazing thing about the liver is it's a sponge that basically expands into the space it's put in. And so he got... I think it was 200 grams of my liver, which is a, you know, kind of a section of my left lateral segment, which is a part of the liver. And the way that I describe it a lot is that it's basically a flower and they took one pet 
though. And if you think about like the, what, the veins in a flower, you know, like all the, if you look at the back of the stems of leaves, you see the little veins that run into each stem. That's what happens. They take both the, the leaf and the plumbing that supplies the nutrition. And so what's amazing about that is that the branch plumbing from my liver becomes a central plumbing for his. And it lives in the middle of his belly, as opposed to the side where most livers live. So and what take, is that? It's it, well, it's it's just like it's kind of like underneath his like breastplate, where as opposed to the normal side, where it's like over to like you know your liver 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 lives over to the right a little bit more. Um, his lives more centrally, uh, and, and so out his actual liver. In the garbage, which is actually different than kidneys. So I learned this as a doctor. I um, mean, I worked in my residency was in a, a transplant center for kidneys. It was a huge transplant center in Central Brooklyn. And the first time I found out that if you get a kidney transplant, all they do is add the extra kidney to your body and they put it in the middle of your belly and they don't actually replace the old kidney and throw that in the garbage because of the geography, it's not necessary. That I thought was like super interesting. For the liver, they actually do take the old one, they throw it in the garbage, or, you know, more or less. Probably uh, dispose of it. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, and then I can make a bad joke about foie gras, but I won't. <laughs> we, uh, we are not going there. <laughs> <laughs> no, the reality is that the coolest thing is that actually, um, after the surgery, and this is the privilege of being a doctor mom, uh, the, the hepatologist, the liver doctor who had gone in to see how everything was going was a friend of mine. And so she took pictures of his liver and my liver. And I give this lecture at NYU, the medical school that I was teaching at the time, about his case. And I show a picture of his liver and mine side by side. And what was amazing is I had gone through medical school. I was a 34-year-old mom of three at that point. I'd gone to college, you know, all kinds of stuff. I live in New York City. Uh, And my liver was like, smooth and gorgeous. It looked like salmon, like raw, you know, fresh salmon. His liver looked like hamburger meat. It was like, like brown and like clunky and, you know, gross looking and fatty. And it's amazing. And, you know, two years of just having a terrible disease or, you know, 34 years of living as a human in the adult world, that was enough to just in on a macro level, not even on a microscopic level, to just see the impact on an organ um, that proved how much, how important it was for us to be doing this. Well, I remember when I was in medical school in pathology, they showed us the livers of um, several college students who had been in fatal car accidents after a weekend of binge drinking. Right. To emphasize to us what the, just the effects of a 24 hour binge alcohol uh, overdose can do to your liver and what fatty liver looks like. Of course, fatty liver disease is a whole nother topic that we'll talk about in in another episode of In the Ladies Room, um, which is increasing in children and young adults. Uh, Fatty liver disease used to be something we would mostly see in alcoholics or binge drinkers. Uh, But now, of course, we're seeing it much more commonly because of the obesity epidemic and the increase in uh, diabetes. But that's a whole nother show. (laughs) Which I could actually, ironically, for as a teaser, have a conversation about that. Because it turns out my husband had fatty liver disease so severe that he needed gastric bypass surgery to fix that. My goodness. And again, so there's all these interesting things about who knew the liver was so interesting, right? Well, and as anybody who listens to this show or follows me on social media knows, I am a huge supporter of the Global Liver Institute. And uh, for many reasons, Uh, in part because we need to know more about liver disease. It is on the increase, but also because a friend of the show, Donna Cryer, was the founder of the Global uh, Liver Institute, and she was one of our earliest guests on the show. But we've also done an episode about the Live Her campaign uh, from Healthy Women uh, with renowned photographer Emmy, Emily Blinko and her mother. Uh, Emily Blinko's mother, uh, Debbie Parsley, had primary biliary cirrhosis. And Emily was therefore at risk because that also has a genetic component. And of course, we're always talking about genetic diseases. I do want to also point out that the Global Liver, Liver Institute has the hashtag Living Burgundy campaign. And you and I are both wearing burgundy uh, to support Which this. So I encourage everybody to go on Instagram and use the hashtag Living Burgundy and post your pictures of living your 
best burgundy life. But the more we talk to people, the more we hear that they have a, some kind of family connection with liver disease. So is your husband's situation, was that before Sammy's diagnosis? So it, it, if, you, if you kind of uh, entertain this family tree for a second. So my husband's dad uh, died, uh, you know, passed away a few years ago of fatty liver disease consequences thereafter. It, that had happened right after we had diagnosed Sammy. So right. I was convinced in my Oscom's razor world that there had to be a connection somehow, because how is it that my father-in-law and child both have liver diseases, even though, you know, genetically, I didn't think that my father-in-law had the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Had he been tested or no? Yeah, we tested him and he actually didn't have the gene. So I didn't, I got kind of super frustrated that the problem wasn't going to get solved until after Sammy's transplant, my, my husband uh, was like, you know, an overweight middle-aged Jewish guy from New York. Like you can imagine what he looks like uh, in his workups. He had found out that his liver enzymes were elevated. And when they did it uh, like a ultrasound of his liver, saw that he had a very fatty liver to the point where he was pre serotic And I was like, seriously, we like just solved this problem in our family and I don't have another liver to give, right? Like I had just done it once in our family. And Although I, the, but, the liver regenerates. So your yeah, liver- Yeah, but you can't, you, yes, but you can't donate twice. That was my question. Can you- Yes. Donate? The reason is back to the plumbing issue, right? So remember I said they took the, the, the flower petal with the plumbing and that became his core plumbing. You need that core plumbing to do again. Got so, it. So the petals yeah. regenerate- but the plumbing doesn't regenerate. Basically, it's, it's size expands, but you don't get new plumbing. And that actually is a really important point because when they divide the liver, they divide the plumbing as well in a, if, if it's a deceased donor. And so, chances are you and your husband might not have been a match. Right, well, back to the other matching question you had before is that the liver, because it regenerates and because it's a magical organ in a lot of ways, the way to match a liver versus matching a kidney, it's actually much easier to be a match for the liver it's much harder to be a match for the kidney, having to do with kind of how tightly the match has to be. So my husband, um, you know, I'm looking up ways that he doesn't need a transplant, basically, like if he's gonna have fibrosis and cirrhosis, what's gonna happen? And I find out that gastric bypass surgery may be curative to the metabolic diseases wow. that he has. It's been, it's been shown that it helps reverse the inflammation that's causing him to have a problem. Why is that really important? Because when I have made up in my head, which may not be true, mm -hmm. but I'm going to convince myself that my father-in-law had this inflammatory liver disease that my husband has, which then my husband gave my kid two problems, I the inflammatory liver disease and the alpha one, which is why he was one of the fraction of patients that needed a transplant. Okay, and so, so you know with alpha one um, antitrypsin uh, deficiency that you do get a gene from your mother and from your father. But the over, overwhelming prevailing bias of this podcast is that it's always the father's fault. And the better part is that the data shows that the donation, when it comes from the mother, takes better and the kids get off transplant meds. So in the world, in, as my, I understand it, in my astute physician sense as a mother, <laughs> not only did my husband give him two medical problems, but I'm the one that solved it. And so, that's another bias of this show. The mother always has to fix it. However, the bias of that research, I saw you mention that research and you were profiled in uh, People Magazine, right. Sammy, for doing this. And ironically, you and I had met last summer at the uh, Medical Women's International Association meeting and we bonded and we were talking about all kinds of women physician issues. I had no idea this was part of your backstory mm -hmm. until uh, Samantha B had done this great segment on the organ donasis, uh, donation crisis in the United States. And I had seen that. She posted it on Twitter and you commented with the link to the People Magazine article. And that's why we're here today. But when you mentioned that thing about the research showing that the donation takes better when it's from the mother as opposed to from the father. I was convinced that research was done by men who were trying to make an argument that the mother should be the first choice to have to go through this. I, and it may be true. It was, it, it's actually not really robust data. It's a, it's a, it's a re retrospective study with kids with atresia. But it is funny because they, they wonder, is there like a mitochondrial reason? Like what is it about the mother's liver versus the father's that makes it reject less? And, you know, the other part of the data set, which is probably unrelated, but super interesting, is that women recover faster from the donation. Um, 
they're they don't they don't they'll put it on to childbirth and say that women are more resilient in physical distress. Uh, but I I do think that's interesting. Uh, Sammy and I had the shortest combined stay ever at Columbia um, for the inpatient procedure. I was discharged from the hospital. Like it was, um, so night to discharge was 36 hours. Wow. I was so That is sad. very impressive. But what, what I wasn't- You talked but, about in the People Magazine article that I do want you to talk about here. Uh, you used the word earlier, privilege. Um, and of course, you're so privileged to be a physician and have all of this extra, extra body of knowledge and of course, knowing where to go and all the physicians to see, et cetera. But let's talk about the realities for a moment about mm -hmm. health insurance and coverage. And you also mentioned in the article the ability to take time off from work and to you know, really recuperate and to help him recuperate. So talk to us about those issues and how right. that impacted so your journey. So I want to, so you have to frame it in, so if we know we're going to do a living organ transplant, right? So we can, I, I do want to cover, we should talk a little bit about the cataract organ recovery system and, and how not great it is, um, you know, in America. And that's actually what the Sambi article uh, set, um, segment. segment was about. Uh, and so I think it's important to kind of discuss that a little bit, because now that I do this work a little, I, I'm more familiar with how much work we really do need to be doing. Um, but for the living donor, you know, so they asked me in the middle of an ER to be a, a donor and I say yes. And that would happen really for any mom, right? Think about it. But when we think about how that exists in the framework of both privilege and, you know, costs to your family. So first and foremost, health insurance, right? So we are lucky enough to have insurance but from both of our parents, but there isn't any universal access right now to health insurance in America. And there are a lot of conversations to discuss how to get to universal access, but it is the opinion of every physician I know and most most Americans that we need to get coverage to every person in America right now um, in a way that is realistic and accessible because not having insurance so we have a lot of dialysis patients who come to the ER regularly for their dialysis because they have no insurance and in order to get anyone to pay for it or even to have access they have to literally register in the ER three times a week to go and get their dialysis because there's no way to get them. The most expensive, expensive. way to right. provide health care. So we are really good at finding expensive workarounds for a system that's broken. Mm -hmm. So that is so the idea that we fundamentally had insurance and that I could worry about my family and not going medically bankrupt from this. Which is the number um, cause of bankruptcy in the United States is uh, medical unexpected right. medical expenses and the unexpected medical expenses Even just to kind of have insurance right so that's the that's the thing that, that that people lose sight of is that just having insurance alone isn't enough and that's actually why all the proposals that are coming out of the 2020 candidates are really important because every one of those candidates is putting together a public option whether it's either medicare for all or medicare for all who wants it or the public option or whatever words you use um, that allow a federal system to prevent people from going medically bankrupt because it's not the first time you get a diagnosis it's the treatments they're after and it's the constant need for hospitalizations and the impact regularly of how that adds up or it's one catastrophic illness and right a huge a huge benefit of obamacare or the affordable care act was it attempted and of course it wasn't perfect but it attempted to standardize what things needed to be covered. So even amongst people who have insurance, many insurance plans uh, do not cover the medical expenses for the donor. Right. And, and that's, it. right. And there, and that, so if you look at, so the now field the donor profile alone, knowing that it was sa technically Sammy's insurance covered my donation. And the reason has to do with the, uh, that it is economically feasible to get the transplant done that way. Uh, but it was not my insurance that was covering the donation. Now, if you then go into the process of being a donor, there's actually a lot of logistical issues in being a donor who's a parent. So if I was a single mother with the same three kids who had to go into the hospital for multiple days of a workup, so I wouldn't have gotten paid for my job if I was an hourly worker, then my child has to go into the hospital for multiple days for his illness and workup. Then we go into the hospital, both of us, but I can't take care of him, right? Mm -hmm. So the biggest issue in our family, and this goes back to dads and moms, at least in our family, when we have a mom and a dad, is my husband's not a doctor. And so the idea that I was going to be unconscious and unable to manage my son's medical like issues, and that my husband had to do it, like, and I, I say had to because he's the other primary parent, my mom's a nurse, my best friend, his doctor, literally were with him 
as advocates and translators, because that was my, that's what I do, right? In my family, I'm the medical hub. So by being unconscious and then recovering, I needed to replace myself in that way. And my husband was really excited actually to be able to be the champion of Sammy's care. I mean, he still, if you get him, you know, kind of after two glasses of wine on a Friday night and ask him what it was like to see his kid with, kid with tubes and lines, he gets very emotional because it's, it's not normal to him. We, we see past those things. Uh, he he it, it imprinted on him in a way that he can't describe still. So then it's the recovery, right? So I took three months off of work um, in what I call my fourth maternity leave, um, unpaid, to be able to recover from the surgery and to be able to take care of my child. If I was a single parent with marginal insurance or no insurance and multiple children, that is not something that I could have done. And the system that doesn't support this at all, it becomes a non-feasible option for a lot of people who otherwise have the organ in their body ready, willing, and able to donate. So the way that I look at my privilege, I mean, it starts with the concept that I could say yes, yeah. right? Instead of going through what Sam B covered so eloquently, which is a horribly broken or organ procurement um, like process in America that is maybe about to start getting fixed with an executive order out of this administration trying to look at all of these OPOs and say, how can they work better? Right? And OPOs are organ procurement organizations for those who did not see right. the Zambi uh, segment, which she and, did on Halloween, by the way, because she described it, you know, obviously hyperbolically, but, you know, as extremely scary. Um, well, I mean, it, it is, right? And it's funny because if you kind of, if, let us switch gears for just one second, right, as physicians. So growing up as a physician, as an emergency doctor, I dealt with the kind of sudden death of patients all the time, but most of those patients aren't eligible for donation, right? Yet you still have to call into the system for, you know, administrative reasons. Yet there are patients that do pass away in a way that makes them um, eligible donors significantly. And so you're kind of the training around um, organ donation becomes very fragmented. You're not really ever cultured into the idea that this is an opportunity to save somebody's life. Because you're-, you're and Also the whole process of asking somebody or their family member, first of all, has to happen very fast. Most people have not had that discussion with their family members, so they don't know what their wishes would have been. Yes, some of us had it on our driver's licenses, um, but it's a very difficult time. Right. And it's, well, it's also, it's, it's the team in the, in the hospital. So let's say I'm in the ICU and a patient does pass away, uh, you know, is, 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 is dying a neurological death. So they are a candidate. I, as the, in the ER, I'm, as a doctor can't ask, can't initiate the conversation. It has to be the organ procurement organization that comes in and has that conversation. So the system has to work even just to start the conversation. And so we know that there's such varied success. Um, and I use the word very, very generously, uh, you know, in the, in the, even initiating the conversations, much less to the ultimate procurement. And yet we don't think about the idea that there are literally people dying every day when that system fails them. Right. And if we're not capturing a hundred percent of our organs and we're not capturing hundred percent of our organs that could possibly go on to save somebody else's life, that seems like a tragedy, like a real tragedy. And the Sam B segment, which in full disclosure, uh, was supported by an organization, and, like it, it ended with a, a a blip about organize. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, that. So what organize, is organize is a uh, a startup functionally that is trying to um, de silo uh, the organ procurement system. It was started by a friend of mine who I met through Columbia because his dad had a heart transplant, uh, which because that goes to show you how how this community really kind of comes together in uh, the idea of, of basically you know, lifting the covers off this system that has existed for 50 years without any real oversight, you know, and that the opportunity to really say, if we're going to talk about, you know, cadaveric donations and procurement, what do we need to be doing well? And if we're not doing it well, who's checking on that? Right. And like, how are we holding that to account? Because What's these are the not- oversight process? <laughs> These are federal contractors, right? They have government contracts to do this work. Somebody needs to be making sure that they're doing it well, because if they're missing tens of thousands of organs a year and kidneys, which is how you started this, are really the organs that 
these patients are on dialysis three days a week. They are, it, it changed, like the, the transplant versus not transplanted existence for a kidney patient is a totally different world, right? And so it is, it, it, it is overwhelming to somebody like me that solves problems for a living, mostly in the emergency department, who solved it in my own family with living donation, to look at all these other patients who either can't have a living donation for like lots of logistical reasons, or their organ itself is not qualified for a living donation because they need a heart or they need lungs, you know, to watch a system that's so broken not be fixed. And well, so- I did have two parents who were willing and able, but one of his parents already had a liver problem. And we didn't, that's, and yeah, and we didn't, didn't actually know, know that, yeah. right? And so if we had worked him up first, we would have found out his liver disease earlier. Right. So there's so many other issues, but one of the other issues I want to get back to Sammy's particular disease, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. It is the most common uh, genetic uh, disorder that causes liver disease in children. Um, and I believe it's one of the most common in adults, aside from alcohol. You know, al you know, alcoholic cirrhosis. Um, in adults, of course, it can present as lung disease as well. Um, most people who didn't see the Sam B episode didn't really learn about this other than from watching episodes on Grey's Anatomy and other dramas where the person comes into the emergency room, they're found to be in liver failure, and there just happens to be somebody who dies in the same day in the same hospital in a motor vehicle accident and they manage to do the transfer and the transplant and the person falls in love all within a one hour episode. So that's not real life. Uh, in real life, this is a condition that most people don't know about. So I wanna talk about testing. Um, so obviously Sammy got tested. Were your other children tested? Yeah, so alpha one is, uh, it's a disease underdiagnosed definitively, mostly because it presents, it used to present in patients who were got lung disease and they had smoked because that's so many people smoked. So they blamed it on the smoking, they got emphysema and nobody looked any harder. Then people who didn't smoke started getting emphysema and they started understanding more about this disease and it existed because it's a simple blood test. Yeah. When Sammy got diagnosed, so then they, in the seventies, they realized that a percentage of people who had this gene had liver disease as babies. So they worked it into this liver disease profile of babies that are yellow beyond the first couple of weeks of life. And yellow so usually can be lots of things. You know, it can be completely normal. Uh, breastfed babies can have jaundice. Right. Um, yeah, lots of reasons. It doesn't. So when you're yellow, there's a there's a whole working pathway. The and so, <laughs> right, the yellow workup is more or less what it is. And so, he, and the yellow workup, this is part of it. So we found that he was yellow for this reason. We then went back and said, okay, now because our other kids were okay. The, there's no emergency to test them that day. But once he kind of got our deep breaths together and we were just watching and waiting, we went back and we tested our other children. And um, I have two other kids. I have a daughter who is a carrier and a son who is a, a home as I get unaffected. So he has, he inherited neither his gene. His children won't get this. He has, there's, there's no risk. We actually went back to my family. And so I have two sisters. One of my sisters is a carrier and the other one is unaffected. And we tested my parents who are actually both carriers, uh, which is really interesting because no one in my family. So of the genetics, so we had three kids, two carriers, one, one unaffected. If we had had the fourth, we, we could have had our own Sammy cast. Right, so um, most people have forgotten about ninth grade biology. Exactly. They learned about uh, Gregor Mendel and the peas. Right. Um, so even if both parents are carriers, obviously that doesn't mean the kids are necessarily going to get this disease, but obviously genetic counseling is so important. Um, right. And of course, this is not a test that everybody gets. This is only a test that people would get if they are at risk. Uh, and there are lots of reasons that people don't want to get tested. You want to speak to that issue? Well, so, right. So there are, there, especially in the information, we, we, we are way ahead of our technology privacy versus our technology capabilities, right? And so uh, Sammy obviously is a, known, is a known affected person by this genetic disease, but you, there are a lot of diseases people don't want to have documented because of the, especially with the healthcare system being in flux, your insurance could be affected by your ability as a carrier of a disease, because not just being affected. having a pre-existing pre condition. condition. Which is another reason that this whole pre-existing conditions thing is so important 
right. even for the 14 people in this country who don't yet have a pre-existing condition. Totally. So, I mean, you can, migraine headaches can be considered a pre-existing Having condition. Having had a C-section is considered a pre-existing condition. Yeah. So, uh, so Sammy, the thing about the genetics part, so every time two carriers have a baby, there's a one in four chance that they're going to be totally fine. And there's a one in four chance they're going to be totally affected and a 50% chance they're going to be a carrier themselves. Um, Sammy, when he has a baby, however he has a baby, because I have no idea how people will have babies by the time he has babies. <laughs> I'm convinced it's all going to be test tubes anyway, regardless of who you have the baby with. Uh, and I just read whatever, the Handmaid's Tale, so that's a whole nother nightmare. <laughs> so I met Margaret Atwood like two days ago. Wow. How did She's you meet her? At a fancy glamour women of the year event and oh, I was very lucky. So fun fact, I went to the fancy glamour women of the year event in the past. I am a glamour college woman of the year uh honorable mention winner. It yes, another but I was so in the honorable mention when I was in college a hundred years ago. So did. another woman that we uh, both know, Vinnie Aurora, was all. Uh, I mean, I'm uh, not Vinnie Aurora. Reshma Jaxi was also a 25 under 25 glamour women of the year as well. Wow. So well, I am not under 25. <laughs> no, then not now. She's like, I mean, please, she has like two kids. But it's it it is nice to see all these women physicians having come from greatness. So Margaret Atwood, of course, is the author of The Handmaid's Tale, which of course you know became a hit. TV series and I'm way behind. So I just read the book. So it's amazing. Have it, so our data privacy. So, so Sammy will have to have whoever the other genetic material is for his babies will have to be tested to make sure that he is not uh, going to have his own affected child. Because and as a gynecologist, even, I just need to do my public service announcement for this is yet another reason that all pregnancies should be planned as opposed to the 50% of pregnancies that are not planned. <laughs> We have an older podcast on, on, on pregnancy. Oh, and we have. And, and, oh, yes. <laughs> so, so about so. testing, I do just want to make sure I do a shout out to the Alpha One Foundation, uh, which provides free confidential test kits. And I want to emphasize free. Um, and so I do want to give people that information. Uh, they can go online at alpha one, the number one, not spelled out, dot org. Or they can actually call the foundation at 877-228-7321. And of course, their website has a lot more information about who uh, should get tested and you know, what the implications are. And they're doing research on this, which is extremely And, and again, back to what we do with our privilege after we come out of the clouds. So I, when we became active in out in the F1 Foundation as well, uh, mostly because, again, as a physician and as a mother, we were always going to make sure that the organization supporting his disease, whether his disease is alpha-1 or is transplant, because as our doctor says at Columbia, when you get a transplant, you functionally, if you're lucky enough, replace one disease with another disease. And so you become a transplant patient, which has its own slew of lifetime risks um, and complications. So tell, and us, so tell us what the top uh, concerns are. Obviously, he's taking anti-rejection medicine for the rest of his life or until we figure out an alternative. Right. So that's the biggest one, right? So he takes anti-rejection medicine every day, although he takes a pill and he basically, he's taken a pill every day of his whole life and he doesn't pay much attention to it. Um, Anna Pariah, who I mentioned before, who's the founder and president of, global, of the Global Liver Institute, uh, just celebrated the 25th anniversary of her liver transplant. She did. I, yes. And that is so exciting. Um, and most of the people, she had it for uh, autoimmune hepatitis, correct? Correct. Right. And so most people that have that have it as a teenager. It's, it's usually a pubescent um, thing. So you get to see what happens to people as they grow up because of where they have their transplant. So, uh, so the Sammy's bucket happens. There's a biliary atresia bucket. Then there's an alpha one bucket. Then there is a, uh, you know, an autoimmune hepatitis bucket and then the biliary cirrhosis bucket. So you see these transplants happen over people's lives. Um, so, it, you know, really the consequences of being a transplant patient are about the medications you need to take for your lifetime. So, uh, you know, things like, skin cancers, God forbid, and lymphomas, God forbid, and all these other things that, that, that could happen as a result of being on medications that modulate your immune system. Um, because nothing, is, nothing in your body exists on its own and everything exists in continuum. Uh, Sammy had one rejection a couple of years ago. And the way that my doctor told us was so profound to me was rejection is not ejection. Mm -hmm. So just because your body is rejecting an organ for a small period of time, it doesn't mean it's literally kicking it out of the body. 
And so it's just a balance issue and you have to get back into balance. And so I kind of think about that in a very Zen way to say that Sammy's entire existence right now is this balance between his body's ability to ignore a foreign entity and yet let it work the way it needs to work, you know? And that seems like karmically awesome on some level, you know? And if you think about it, that's really what we're going for with any illness that we're managing or any chronic condition. And so he went from an acute situation where he was in acute distress and needed a transplant imminently. Uh, and now he just has this condition the same way other people manage their diabetes or manage their high blood pressure or cholesterol or you know osteoporosis or any other thing that is managed and stable. And how's he handling it? <laughs> he's how old now? He's seven. He is, uh, he's awesome. He's hysterical. You know, I, I don't, he's a third kid and I think third kids are different and special in their own right. Uh, and I think the third kid you say, just don't get blood on my carpet. Right. Like, it's just <laughs> like, they live a life that's without boundaries usually anyway. And I think ever since he's been a baby, um, he doesn't take, um, like challenges seriously. Right. He's somebody in a lot of ways. He doesn't get frustrated. He doesn't, he doesn't, he like makes things happen. And, and, you know, it's very funny because you wonder how much of this is imprinted from when they're babies. Like, is it that they are, um, do they realize when they're one and two years old that they're going through this extraordinary hardship and that their resilience is kind of created there? Or is it that they were resilient, which is why they were able to get through it without it being an overwhelming thing? I don't know. Um, what I know about him is, or both, um, right. Or exactly, like, is this nature and nurture at its best, you know, kind of symbiosis? Um, what I know about Sammy particularly is that he is, he is the, the, he is an extraordinary resilient child that you don't know anything happened to him unless I tell you. Mm-hmm. And even his scar, even the way he walks, even what he does, like, if this is not a defining moment of his life in the way that he communicates with humans until they ask it and then he tells you the whole thing and tells you what happens. That's awesome. I love what you talked about in the People Magazine article also about how his friend's parents, you know, keep syringes and their, his friends want to take their medicine, you know, the way he takes his medicine. Even in camp, right? So he went to sleepaway camp for the first time this summer. I go there, I'm the doctor, we can do another whole podcast on that. Mm -hmm. Um, And at the window where the kids come to take their medicine, he's the smallest kid that takes pills. And like, you see these 12 and 13 year old kids, mostly boys, but some girls, uh, you know, like, (laughs) you know, with the pill as they have to choke down their anti-allergy medicine or whatever it's going to be. And this kid's popping a transplant pill in his mouth and walking away. And, you know, these, these older kids, you get to say, he can do it. Why can't you? Or he says to them, guys, it's not that hard. And he gets them through taking out the pill. So yeah. It would be an excellent topic. Um, I do, we could talk about this all day, but just in the last few minutes, I want to switch gears on you. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of listeners who are women physicians. So I want you to talk about feminine. Another whole podcast. So Feminem is... <laughs> well, how can I mean, come back? <laughs> totally. So Feminem really started because I wanted women to talk to each other. So it is a, it started as a blog And this uh, is website women in emergency medicine. For women in emergency medicine, although I will say that its impact has been broader than that. And it was really about the idea that as females in emergency medicine, as women, you know, we have had very specific challenges put in front of us and our solutions are actually ironically not that dissimilar from each other but nobody was talking to each other Mm -hmm. and so if we could create historical memory on the solutions we had we could maybe create a community and then you know change would expand itself and it's been remarkable um you know the website was great and then we started a conference which was amazing and then we have a podcast and so all these layered effects that thousands of followers on your twitter feed including oh yeah and and thousands but what is this it's this it's this kind of systematic and continuous breaking down of the patriarchy of medicine without like smashing it over the head, right? It's much more about this kind of groundswell of continuous support that includes people that aren't ready necessarily all the time at the beginning to join a feminist movement. Mm -hmm. And so they get to be part of something that they don't really entirely understand in the beginning, but as they're there, they kind of still feel safe and welcome. 
and they know that it's not going to remove, you know, it's, so it's, it's been an amazing thing to watch grow and I love it. Uh, and that actually gave us the platform to work on Time's Up, which was the next thing that we started doing, um, which is why we were at the AMWA International Congress. So tell me about Time's Up Healthcare. So Time's Up Healthcare is a arm of Time's Up Foundation, which is, uh, you know, started around sexual assault and harassment, mostly entertainment. And the healthcare arm, we started about a year ago to discuss the culture of safety, dignity, and equitable work in healthcare. Uh, we're in the process of hiring our official first executive director right now, wow, which is so exciting. Yes, it's so exciting. And so it's been a volunteer effort until now. Um, the Medical Women's International Association meeting, the organization received a, a huge award yeah. uh, from, and, uh, from the American Medical Women's Association president. Yes. Uh, and so it's been really exciting to have another element of this kind of equity work take hold. Um, and obviously doing it with Time's Up has been really fun because we get to highlight, not everybody sees how great women physicians are. And I think when I go to a lot of these other spaces, whether it's the Glamour Awards or from working with Time's Up or doing some popular culture media, even around transplants, you know, women physicians are a remarkable set of people. Uh, we're generally the care hubs for our family. We're people that have worked in adversity almost from the, the day we started our careers. And yet we've done it with this kind of sense of altruism and humanity and perseverance um, at, at the forefront of life and death, right? So like, I think it's amazing that just now kind of in a larger sense, women physicians are coming out of their shells and are now seen in popular culture media and on, you know, what because of podcasts and because of social media and because of all these other platforms are really able to be recognized for this very unique and kind of amazing skill set that I think we have and our ability to communicate, especially as we go forward into like the 2020 election and we talk about healthcare access and equity across all different marginalized identities and the economy and what it means sustainably and all reproductive health access, which obviously is such a huge part of you know gender equity at its core. Um, women physicians are qualified climate change and how it affects you know asthma health asthma asthma even just think about what happens when you have rolling blackouts to people that are on oxygen yeah you don't even need to look at like the systemic effects of like you know environmental racism but you can talk about the impact of a single entity a flood or a fire or a blackout on the ability to stay alive well and so, we saw that in the uh, in hurricane maria and how it affected puerto rico is the death toll was huge in large part from people who just couldn't get access to medical care or people who were already in hospitals. And we saw this in Katrina as well, people who were already in hospitals who couldn't get evacuated to safe places. And so my, my, my rally cry now is that women physicians are kind of like, we're the jack of every trade affecting the current crises in America, gun violence. I mean, some of my best friends are just at the forefront of gun and we violence had reduction. one of your uh, female uh, emergency medicine Megan? colleagues, uh, Megan Ram Dr. Megan Ramey, yeah. uh, talked about gun violence from the perspective of an emergency room physician. And this is something I'm ranting about all the time. And I was literally crying yesterday mm -hmm. uh, with the Santa Clarita uh, yeah. shooting. I saw something I had never seen before on the television coverage. And that was, you know, of course, all the kids come out marching with their hands up. But then after the immediate hands up marching out, they were all standing there just calmly on their phones, texting their parents to let them know they were okay. Yeah. And as a parent, I have gotten that text from each of my children uh, in different uh, active shooter situations uh, in school. And I will tell you, I thought about that and how I felt getting that text right. you know, from my daughter saying she was in the college library hiding in a janitor's closet under a sink. Uh, and I just wanna tell you, I love you and you know, I don't know what's gonna happen. Um, it, that was horrifying. Absolutely horrifying. And I can tell you, at my daughter's college graduation, I literally did this silent prayer of thanks that both my kids got through college without being shot. So I will say, and again, to take this in a very short tangent, we're actually doing an event on Thursday with um, a candidate's husband and, his, and our kids. And it's about um, communicating to children 
uh, the questions that they have around what's going to happen next in America and making sure that their questions are answered. And it's about the idea that he's a teacher and he's young and he's able to communicate with them really well. But it's about the fact that our kids are listening to what's happening around the world. And again, as women physicians, you know, I spent a lot of time demystifying my son's illness, right? And making it safe for my kids to feel like it wasn't going to ruin their lives, that Sammy wasn't in danger of dying all the time. Like that is a deliberate, um, that, that took a lot of effort on our part as parents and our community. The same thing is true for what's happening in the world, kind of writ large with politics and gun violence and climate change. And there are so many things that our kids are scared of and that they're being affected and they're not even sure how to ask. And we're scared, but somehow we have to temper our fear and convey to them that we're going to take care of this, yeah, even though absolutely. we're not so sure we're going to. And the things they're afraid of are things we don't even think about. So Kamala Harris uh, just said in an interview yesterday that she was talking to a school child who said what she was worried about is that they've been trained for what to do if this happens when they happen to be in homeroom. But what if she's in her history class that doesn't yeah. have the big closet? You know, or what if she's in another classroom when the active shooter comes in? You know, it's funny. It's unfathomable to us that this is something they have to think about. You know, it, it, it wouldn't be a crazy idea to watch a presidential can, uh, debate be moderated by children. You that know? would be awesome. <laughs> I, I, and, I, and I say this, The Daily had a podcast yesterday about like a third grader's questions on the impeachment. Watching our kids, they're, they're watching politics for the first time in their lives because they know that they're, it's their future on the line. And they know that there are all these problems that nobody is solving. And so, I, again, not to like hijack this entire podcast away from it. But this is what we do in the ladies' room. We and that's, talk the way we talk as women. And the way we talk as women is our conversations as professionals are never exclusively professional. Our conversations as mothers are never exclusively maternal. Our conversations are, as citizens and uh, people who care about our country are never exclusively political. All of these roles that we wear and all of these things inform our personal perspective as well as our opinions. Well, you know, it's funny. That's the fundamental tenet behind intersectionality, mm -hmm. right? The idea that no part of your identity is able to be separated from your other identities. And so when we look about, when we look at activism and we look at the future and we look at policy and we look at, you know, candidates' proposals and we look at what we're doing, we need to remember that, you know, healthcare in America is intricately connected to employment in America and harassment in America because if a woman is in an environment where she is at a marginal, like she's an hourly worker at 39 hour, 40 hours in order to keep her health insurance, take care of her family. If we can somehow get her health insurance that's not connected to her employment, can she leave the place by which she's getting sexually harassed, right? And I have to say, as a woman physician who also runs a company with no other employees other than myself, who is of a certain age, it's extremely hard for me to buy health insurance. There's only one right. health insurance plan at any cost, and I will tell you it's a huge cost, right. that I can purchase in the state of New Jersey as a single 58-year-old woman who's self-employed. Right. So this is something that affects, obviously, I'm happy to pay it, and I am fortunate that I can pay it, but it's something that affects all of us no matter where we right. are. And, that. so, and, and that's why when we do our work with Time's Up and we think about kind of women of color, in the healthcare community who are unable to separate out their gender identity from their racial identity, or if they're also a member of the LGBT community. Like these principles, these ideas that policies are intricately connected and that are, and, and that back to what you said about women physicians, like we are never just one thing. And so our need to, um, the way we communicate and the way that we think about these interconnected things. The reason why I donated to my kid was that I understood the healthcare system and I understood what it was to be a mom and I understood what it was like to be a patient. And immediately in that moment, I put all those identities together and said, yes, that's it. Without even thinking, because that was my intersectional identity at that moment. Um, and so that's important, I think, as we think about um, like our work going forward. And I think for so many people, I meet so many people who still say to me they are not interested in politics because it doesn't really affect them. I think my number one message to everyone is it affects every single thing that we do and that every single vote matters. And this is why we have issued an open invitation to every candidate, every woman candidate 
who's running for any national or statewide uh, office. We've already interviewed two candidates, um, one who was running uh, for Congress from my district, uh, who then stepped out uh, to let the leading candidate take the way. And my district had been red forever. And we finally flipped our district to a candidate who is pro healthcare and pro choice and pro all of the things that. Who I, is it? I'm curious. Uh, Malinows uh, representing. Yeah, Tom Malinowski. Yeah, Tom yeah. Malinowski, who has promised to come on this podcast, but has every so often we allow a man to come into the ladies' room. And just last week, we had Dr. David Shulkin in the ladies' room uh, wow. with the former cabinet secretary of the Veterans oh, yeah. Administration. Of course, there's two million women veterans. Uh, and he just wrote a fabulous book that I recommend for everyone, which details all of these issues called It Shouldn't Be This Hard to Serve Your Country. So I will say two things before you, if you as a position of privilege. One <laughs> is that the... Um, the, the desire to be non-political is an absolute extension of your privilege. And it is important that if you decide to be non-political for even a second, you think about why you can not be political. Um, there are, every person fighting for their own rights in America can't be fighting by themselves. And so if you are not now threatened by the lack of opportunity or access, then you have to think about why you still have it. Um, and so I, I, I have stopped allowing people to say in some way, I don't want to be political. It, again, because that just, if you check your privilege and say, I don't have to be political because I am a fully employed white woman in New York City who doesn't have to worry about access to healthcare and I'm happy and I'm not going to care about anybody else. Well, at least then you're acknowledging that. But that well, acknowledgement needs to happen. Those people too is you might be one divorce away from being uninsured. Well, um, I think you know, it's and funny. I can tell you when you yeah. get divorced, you are uninsured that day. I've uh, so, been there, done that. <laughs> right. But when I think about actually like healthcare plans in America, and this actually is part of that, all the people that choose to not have health insurance are somehow very privileged in their own way because they choose to ignore the idea that this could happen to them, whatever. And you have to think about a way to retroactively get people enrolled in healthcare, you know, if that happens to them. And I think that as long as every one of these healthcare plans thinks about how to automatically enroll somebody or retroactively enroll somebody, because it is a position of privilege to decide to not be active in the healthcare system. It is a position of privilege not to be in, active in politics. And again, I'm not going to say to somebody what they can or can't do or have to do, but I do like to highlight that that is a, um, that is a fact. And being active doesn't mean that you have to be an activist. It doesn't no. mean that you have to be uh, going door to door. It doesn't mean that you have to be promoting one candidate or one ideology, but to the 50% of people who didn't vote in our last presidential election, it means you have to show up on election day. Because and even- You have yeah. to vote for your values. Because what we're in a very interesting time period now, and we're seeing this in the impeachment hearings, uh, and Dr. Shulkin and I talked about this at great length, and he talked about this at great length in his book, is that so many people think, okay, government decisions don't affect me personally. But now it, we've come to a point where it's affected our values. And it's affected what, what we care about as our reputation as Americans. And it care, what we care and what we want our shared values to be. And I think that's where we really need to stand up and take a position that's you know, way beyond ourselves. It also is about the idea of um, carrying forward, not just carrying backwards. Like the idea that we're doing this in anticipation of leaving a planet to our children and the idea of creating a space by which they can go to school and survive. Even if you don't have kids, even if you're 85 years old and you're about to leave this earth, realizing that part of that existence on this earth and the privilege is that it was left for you and you're supposed to be leaving it for somebody else. Yeah, and that's um, the Takun alum uh, principle of leaving the world a better place than it was when you found it. And we have not done that. Our generation is the first generation that will not have as long a life expectancy as our parents did, uh, which is something I never thought I would live to see, especially because I have lived in a time when we've had medical miracles and medical innovation and vaccines. And you know things that I once only dreamed about when I was in medical school a hundred years ago. So all of these things are certainly personal. They're certainly political, and they're certainly important. So before I let you go, I have to ask you the most important question all our listeners love to hear, which is: aside from this interview, what was your most unique, interesting, or memorable experience that you ever had in the ladies' room? 
So I actually think that, I, I think you'll enjoy this. So um, I go to a lot of women's events. So most of our bathrooms become gender neutral, but not in the need to be progressive and actually have them be gender neutral, but in the functionality of the fact that there aren't a lot of guys, okay? So I was in at an event uh, where the bathrooms had been turned into gender neutral bathrooms, but only for that moment. And so the bathroom that I went into was the men's room, even though it was filled with ladies. And of course there was a whole line. So I'm looking at the urinal and I'm like, why don't we use urinals, right? And so I literally, said, let's see how hard it is to pee in a urinal. That would be hard. <laughs> and I, um, I chose to pop a squat, for lack of a better reason, over a urinal <laughs> and go, uh, knowing full well that I was maximizing the flow of the, you know, bathroom <laughs> line. The flow, so to speak. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and it was like hysterical because you there's no privacy, so you're just chatting it up while you're going to the bathroom, which is no different than college, let's be completely honest, or how I exist as a mother, where my bathroom is an open door regardless of if I closed it. So I will say that it was a highly successful experience, and I <laughs> would encourage anybody in a fully gendered, you know, whatever inclusive environment to use the urinal more if you can. Um, but it also created a nice conversation while I was there because you we were chatting it up with the line, uh, and that was probably my 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 most recent memorable experience in a ladies room, uh, which was actually a gentleman's room, which was functionally a gender neutral bathroom at that point. So when I was in college and I went to a uh, school where I was only in the ninth class of women at that university, uh, all our bathrooms were converted from men's rooms and they all had urinals and we used them as uh, flower pots. Right. P planted flowers in the urinals. It never occurred to us to actually try to use them. And I think that would be very challenging for anyone who wasn't a certain height. Or it's it's not ideal. This was, a, right. <laughs> this was definitely a, a necessity move, but I am an emergency medicine doctor and that's- You, and, you are solution, or, was this the one on the floor or this was the raised kind? No, it was raised and not, I was squatting. I wasn't okay. like, my thighs are not that strong. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. So in 90 episodes of In the Ladies' Room and asking that question, you are the first one to come up with having actually, well, the first woman, because we have had male guests. Yeah. Um, but we were, uh, you're the first woman who came up with a urinal story. <laughs> I mean, you can talk about makeup and tampons all you want, but this is, this is, this is this the good is, stuff. This is what it's really all about. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I have, I wrote down at least 10 additional episodes and topics that we came up with that we have to cover uh, in the course of this conversation. But thank you so much and good luck to Sammy mm -hmm. and the rest of your family. And thank you for just being such a wonderful, wonderful advocate for women in medicine and certainly for living donors. Thank you so much for having me. This is wonderful. Take care. That's all we have time for today. But let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Dunica. And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Dunica. Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.